All right, last example, solving. Now, when students get into solving, we can get to some pretty complicated problems, okay? And so when students see something that's rather easy, they a lot of times want to go back to, oh, let's do what I already know, right? So a lot of times when we're first teaching solving, the mistake that I, my opinion, a lot of teachers will make is they'll start with a proportion and they'll go into cross multiplication to use that proportion or cross product. I don't like that. And the reason being, and again, I've done it before, so I'm not throwing shade on any teachers because I've been, I've been there before and I've done that. And it's just through my years of experience that I've adjusted how I want to approach students um, solving rational equations. But when I start with students with a proportion as the easiest example, because it's fairly basic to, you know, to solve for and students are familiar with it from algebra one, they just remember it, they stick to it. And so whenever they see a fraction equal to a fraction, they say, hey, I can just go ahead and use the cross product. I'll just do the cross product here and I'll do the cross product here. And the problem with that is we don't have what we call a proportion. Yes, a fraction is equal to a fraction, but that fraction is being subtracted from two, right? So we cannot apply the cross product. You can only apply the cross product, ladies and gentlemen, when you have a proportion. That means a fraction over a fraction. Okay, so yeah, I don't have anything wrong with the cross product. It makes our life a lot easier. Um, it's helpful, it's easy to remember, but you can only apply the cross product when you have a proportion, a fraction equal to a fraction. This is not a proportion. So don't make that mistake, all right? Now, there's another mistake that I have um, at this that we'll have as we work through this problem. So what do we do? Or where do I like to approach things over a problem like this? Well, you could get common denominators and then create a proportion, that's not a bad idea um, because you could get, you could put, you could multiply by X over one times X over one and then combine them and then do a proportion. But my thought process is I just wanna get the greatest common denominator of all of my fractions. And then I can multiply everything by that and just focus on the numerators. So if I look at the LCD, you can see I have a one here, this is X plus one, and this can actually be factored into an X times X plus one. So in my opinion, or not my opinion, I know the LCD in this case is X times a X plus one. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create that denominator for each of one of mine. Now, remember to create equivalent fractions, whatever you do in the denominator, you have to do in the numerator. So over here, I already have an X plus one. So I'm just going to multiply by an X, whatever you do in the denominator, make sure you do in the numerator. And then over here, I don't have anything. So I'm going to multiply that times an X plus one and then X times an X plus one. Now it might be easier in this example just to not write it in the uh, expanded form or the factor form, but write it in the expanded form, which is an X squared plus X. And I'm not sure why I didn't do that. So we're gonna do it here, okay? So let's write that as a X squared plus X. That's gonna multiply here in the numerator as well as in the denominator. Okay, so what is that gonna give us? Well, that's gonna give me a two X squared plus two X all over a X squared plus X minus a X over, if you multiply that, that's gonna be a X squared plus X and then equal to a one over a X squared plus X. Now you could multiply everything times X squared plus X and what would happen is you see, you'd get rid of all your denominators. So that's just gonna leave me with my numerator, which is a two X squared plus two X minus X equals one. Now, I recognize this is a quadratic, and we know when we're dealing with quadratics, we always want to go ahead and set it equal to zero. So I'll subtract a one over to the other side, and I get a 2x squared plus 8x is equal, oops, minus one. Minus one is equal to zero. Now, I can solve by either factoring quadratic formula or completing the square. So what I'm simply going to do is say, all right, let's see if I can break this up into a product of two binomials. So I have a two X and then a X is equal to zero. Um, I want my outer and my inner products to add to an X. So therefore I want this to be a positive one and this to be a negative one. Now I didn't show the zero product property on the last uh, example. So let's just go and break it up because when you have a product equal to zero, you can apply the zero product property, add one divided by two. So X equals a one half and over here X equals a negative one. However, remember when I talked about like the restrictions and that like first video about making sure, you know, following through, that's really important because what are the values that make my denominator zero here? It's going to be zero. So X K 
cannot equal zero, as well as when x equals negative one, because those make our denominator equal to zero. Well, what's the problem over here? One of my solutions is part is in the restriction. So this is what we call an extraneous solution. And that's the last mistake students will make. They get so happy for doing a problem like this, figuring it out, finding the solutions. And then they select x equals negative one as a solution. No, it's a solution to the quadratic. It's not a solution to the original equation because the original equation is restricted when x is equal to zero and x equals negative one, or it's undefined at those values. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, that is an extraneous solution. This is gonna be your solution. 